So today we're looking at the H-cobordism theorem. So we'll start off by recalling the notion of a cobordism. So if we have two smooth oriented n-dimensional manifolds n and n prime, we we'll say they're cobordant. If there's some smooth oriented manifold W of one dimension higher with the property that the boundary of W splits as the disjoint union of M and M prime but with the reverse orientation. So this is the general picture we have. So there's a special notion of a cobordism called a H cobordism where M, uh, the inclusions of M and M prime into W are in fact homotopy equivalences which is equivalent to saying that they're deformation retracts. And we say in this case that M and M prime are H cobordant through this ambient manifold W. So here we have two examples. Um, we can take two small N disks inside of the N dimensional sphere and remove them. This creates two new boundary components, two N minus one spheres. And this gives a H cobordism. And we also have this trivial cobordism. So we can take the Cartesian product of M the closed interval 0, 1, and again it has two boundary components which are just M. Okay, so now we're going to give the statement of the H cobordism theorem, and then we'll look at some uh, results we can derive from that, and then the proof will come towards the end. So the H cobordism theorem says. So if we have two compact simply connected manifolds, M and M prime, of the same dimension M, which are H cobordant through a simply connected manifold uh, W of one dimension higher, so we can, and providing that M is greater or equal 5, we can show that there's a diffeomorphism between W and this trivial cobordism, and we can also choose the diffeomorphism where, uh, to act as the identity when it's restricted to M as one of the boundary components of W, and M as sort of lower boundary component of the Cartesian product of M with a closed interval 0, 1. And so uh, an immediate corollary from this is uh, under the conditions of the H cobordism theorem, M and M prime are diffeomorphic because uh, M is diffeomorphic to M cross 0, which is diffeomorphic to M cross 1. But when we restrict this ambient diffeomorphism between M between W and M cross 0, 1 to uh, the top boundary component, it gives uh, a diffeomorphism between M prime and M cross 1. Okay, so here's a very interesting result we can derive immediately from the H cobordism theorem. So it's a so called high dimensional Poincare conjecture. So the claim is that if M is a smooth manifold of dimension at least 5, which is homotopy equivalent to SM, then in fact these two guys are homeomorphic. So we'll look at the proof. So the proof is divided into two cases. The first case for M greater or equal 6. So um, we use a similar trick to before. We remove two small N disks, and this gives us a H cobordism between the complement of these two N disks and the new boundary components, which are two n minus one spheres. And so the H cobordism theorem uh, gives a diffeomorphism between the complement and uh, this product of the n minus one sphere and the closed interval zero, one. And when we restrict f to the sort of lower boundary component, so the boundary of the first disk, it acts as the identity. So this is described in the following diagram. And the idea is, we then want to extend F over the two missing disks to give a homeomorphism between M and this cylinder where we cap it at the bottom and cap it at the top, which is just uh, an M sphere. So it's quite easy to do on the lower, um, the first disk, C1M, because we know that the restriction to the boundary is the identity, so we can simply use the identity map for the second one, we have to work a bit harder. So when we restrict to the boundary of the second disk, we know that it's a diffeomorphism onto the top part of the boundary, but it's not necessarily the identity, but the idea is you can use this radial extension so we know uh, how it's defined on the boundary, and then, uh, well, 
each point on this uh, closed end disk lies on some unique line connecting the boundary to uh, the center point. Although you do have to be slightly careful, this resulting map is no longer necessarily smooth at the center, <coughs> so it's only a homeomorphism. So we can patch these together, and it gives a homeomorphism between M and uh, the N-sphere. So the case M equals 5, there is a slight problem. We could try to use the same approach, so remove two uh, five-dimensional disks, but then, then the boundary components of these are four-dimensional, and to apply the Hitchcock-Borlism theorem, everything needs to be at least uh, five-dimensional. So we use a neat trick. So uh, if you have a closed five-manifold, then it always exists as the boundary of a six-dimensional manifold, because, say, you could take the Cartesian product with half-closed interval 0, 1, and you can, in fact, show that um, this homotopy equivalence between M, which is now the boundary of W, and S5, which is the boundary of this six-dimensional disk, can be extended to a homotopy equivalence between W and the six-dimensional disk. So W is contractible and simply connected. So in this case, W already has one boundary component, which is M. So we only remove a single uh, six-dimensional disk, which has boundary S5. And then the hypotheses of the Hitchcock-Borlism theorem are satisfied. So in this case, we actually get there's a diffeomorphism between M and S5. And so if you recall the notion of an exotic sphere of dimension n, this is some smooth n-dimensional manifold which is homeomorphic to Sn, but not diffeomorphic. So we've just shown, in fact, that there are no exotic five spheres. There's only one uh, smooth structure. OK, so now we're going to start the long process uh, of the proof of the Hitchcock-Bordism theorem. So uh, this is done by handle decompositions. So recall, the idea was you have your Morse function on your cobordism. Uh, these Morse functions always exist, and they have nice properties, like they form an open, dense subset of the set of all smooth functions on our cobordism. Um, and we could introduce the notion of the ascending cobordism. So we take some point C in our codomain 0, 1, and we can look at the pre-image of the closed interval 0, C and F, and this gives us something called the ascending cobordism, and it has some nice properties. So if there are no critical values of F in some closed interval C, C prime, that is, there's no critical points in the pre-image, then um, I think you can look at the gradient vector field of F and integrate that to show that uh, W, C prime is diffeomorphic to W, C. And so the remaining case is, well, what happens when you pass over some critical point? Well, if the critical point of is of index k, then you can show that diffeomorphically you're attaching a k handle. So in fact, you can slightly improve this. Um, we can always assume that 0 and 1 are regular values of f. Um, otherwise, <coughs> using some uh, generosity or density arguments, you can perturb f to a new Morse function which has no critical points on the boundary of W, so M and N prime. And so this means, in particular, that um, we can find a so-called collar neighborhood of M inside of W. So a collar neighborhood is essentially a neighborhood diffeomorphic to M cross 0 epsilon, which has no uh, critical points in. So then the idea is that you can uh, use your Morse function to successively attach handles to this uh, base Cartesian product going through all of the critical points in order to uh, eventually arrive at W. Okay? So the idea now is let's try to find a Morse function which has low critical points or equivalently a handle decomposition that has no handles because uh, this gives us a series of diffeomorphisms so W1 was just a pre-image of 0, 1 under F, that's W, but then there are no um, critical values between epsilon and 1, so there are no critical points between uh, the pre-images, so we can diffeomorphically bash it down, but we know that this is a collar neighborhood, and then this collar neighborhood is just diffeomorphic to M cross uh, 0, 1. And this diffeomorphism also restricts to the identity on 
uh, m on the left-hand side and m cross zero on the right-hand side. So um, we're going to show that this can be done using handle techniques involving sliding, reordering, creating, and cancelling handles until they're on our left. So the first um, process is a simplification. So initially, these handles could be attached in any old order, but we want to try and show that they can be attached in order of increasing dimension. So attach zero handles first, then one handles, and all the way out to the top. So the quick way to do this is via Morse functions. So it's a general theorem that if f is a Morse function on our manifold W, then we can perturb, uh, change f to a new Morse function G, which satisfies some nice properties. So the set of critical points of G is a set of critical points of f. The Morse indices coincide, but crucially, G is self-indexing, which means for a critical point P, the value G of P is in fact the index of G at P. And so we could use the ascending cobordism from this new Morse function to give a handle decomposition where the indices are increasing. There's a slightly different way of doing this, which is suppose we have the following situation. We've attached a J handle to some ascending cobordism. Then we've attached an I handle on top, where I is less than or equal to J. So the idea is we want to slide the I handle off the J handle in order to consider the I handle to be attached before the J handle is attached. 